I need somebody to love. Could it be anybody? I just need someone to love. Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. Mm, I'm gonna try with a little help from my friends. Ah, good morning, people. Anonymous people. Hello everybody, <laughs> hello everyone, she comes back, five minutes later there's the same amount of people here as there was before. Do I need to start advertising these earlier, do we think? Possibly. Okay, you know me, I'm going to go and have one little nose blow and then uh, we'll get started. It's a big lesson this one, We've, it's, a, it's a lot. Oh, it's good actually, I'm very pleased with it. I like this lesson but it is a big one. Well, thank you for liking this, people. All right. Yes, one last nose blow. Ooh, a little one for cold today. I'm as warmed up as I'm going to get. <laughs> right. Sorry, folks. Ah, let's get going, shall we? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, elastic band, pair of scissors, some scrap paper. Splendid. Ah, really looking forward to this one. I'm going to tell you a little story about one of my favourite characters in history. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
enough fabbing, sorry. Okay, let's get going. Move the screen around for people who've lost interest and wandered off. You ready? Let's do this. Boop. Hello, hello everyone. It is I, Lara Stafford from Theatre of Science. I'm trained to teach physics all the way up to A-level. And this is lesson eight of our IGCSE lessons. Uh, Forces of Motion, lesson eight, Hooke's Law. This is one of my favorite lessons because I love Robert Hooke. He's just a great character. And Hooke's Law is like a nice kind of, it's, it's an all-in-one. There's a lot in this lesson. It's a big lesson, but we are going to cover pretty much pretty much everything you need to know about Hooke's Law. And then, as usual, uh, in my Facebook group, I'll post some links to like websites and practice questions that you can use to get your head around this um, once you've listened to the lesson. Okay, right, let's just go straight into it. We need to talk about relationships between things to help you understand what a law is. So, yeah, I'm just going to give you a sheet. Here you go. Um, here are some relationships between things, and I'd like you to sketch some graphs. This is good practice if you've been to the previous lessons, which you should have been, really. You know, all that stuff we did about, like, distance time graphs. Um, for the following relationships, sketch a simple graph. You may add numbers if you like. In each case, note, does the graph go through zero, and is it a straight line? All right, so here's the first graph. I've put rainfall going upwards on the y-axis and level of pond going across. Can you sketch, please, just a really quick sketch, a graph to show how the water level of a pond changes as rainfall increases. So as rainfall goes up, what happens to the level of the pond? Does it go through zero? Is it a straight line? Oh, brilliant, just had a burst of people join us. We have literally only just started. Um, the second one, sketch a graph to show how the amount of layers you wear changes as snowfall increases. So layers along the bottom, snowfall on the x-axis pointing upwards. As the snow falls, what, is, what does that do to the amount of layers you're wearing? T-shirt, jumper, whatever. Um, third one, sketch a graph to show the force of gravity pulling down on something, how that increases as its mass increases. You really need to, have, if you haven't been to any previous lessons, just skip that one out for now. How does the weight of something change as its mass changes? Excellent revision. And number four, sketch a graph to show how the amount of money you have increases as the time you work increases. So imagine you earn five pounds per hour. How does the amount of money you earn change as time goes by? Does it go through zero? Is it a straight line? And then this is kind of if you finished, but also a very good brain exercise. Uh, and also I couldn't think of very many, so I need help. Um, can you sketch, give your own example of a relationship between two things where the line is straight and of a relationship between two things where the line goes through zero? It might just be the same graph you do for that. I'll give you a minute for that. Oh, well, I just sort of wiggle my bum around and try and get warm. Literally just silently dancing behind you. Hello, people who are just joining us. You've literally just seen my face to say hello, and then I've given you this sheet. So you have not missed anything if you're joining in live now. Uh, oh, there's some tissues, brilliant. Oh, what do you think, 30 seconds? It's just, just fast sketches and then I'll go through them with you. You're really missing out on some moves here. Right. What do you think? Should we get going? <coughs> Ten. Nine. Quickly. Think about the, the pond. Someone thought the pond was just like a pond liner in the ground. No, it's a natural pond. So just do they go through zero? Is it a straight line? Five. Four. Three. Two. Uh, one. All right. Come up here then. Let's talk about relationships. So, yes, um, we're looking at a law. Today's lesson is called Hooke's Law. Basically, a law in science uh, is, is kind of a relationship between two things. If, if you're a scientist, especially like 400 years ago, if you noticed in the natural world that two things had a special relationship, then uh, you could pr propose a law, get your name on it. So, the special kind of relationship we're generally looking for when we want to know laws and how nature works is relationships that are directly proportional. I'm just going to flip you. Oh no, I don't have to flip you. It's YouTube. Yes. If two things are directly proportional, 
then the graph of their relationship is a straight line that goes through zero. Okay, directly proportional means that as one thing goes up, the other thing goes up by the same amount. So like as one thing doubles, the other thing doubles. As one thing triples, the other thing triples. We'll go into it, you'll get it. Right, so here we go. The first one then. <clears throat> How does the water level of a pond change as rainfall increases? Well, did you get it going through zero? I don't think it should. When rainfall is zero, when it's not raining, there's still water in a pond, right? So when rainfall is zero, I'm going to put the level of the pond, I'm not going to bother putting numbers on, but somewhere over here, like half a metre or a metre or whatever. Then when the rain starts to fall, I'm going to say at least, at least initially, nature's complicated, but I think kind of immediately, it would be pretty proportional. So I think if you've got like a centimetre of rainfall, then that would fill the pond up by an extra centimetre. Two centres of rainfall might mean it's uh, two centimetres fuller than it was before and so on and so on. So I think once you have this weird start, not on zero, that graph is gonna be a straight line. Nailed it. So what we would say is that's a proportional relationship. It's proportional because as one goes up, the other one goes up, but it's not directly proportional because the, the line isn't going through zero. It's not like one doubles and the other one doubles, okay? Right, next one. How does the amount of layers you wear change as snow falls? Again, it's not going through zero, is it? Like, it's not snowing at the moment and you are probably wearing some layers. So, I don't know, let's go here. Maybe we could put numbers on this one. I would be, I'm wearing two layers, I think, right now. So let's put two. When the snow is not falling, I wear two layers. Uh, if there was a centimetre of snow on the ground, I'd probably put an extra jumper on. Two centimetres of snow, I, I might even put my coat on. Three centimetres of snow, I'm probably going to be putting a blanket on. But after that, as snow falls, I'm not going to put more, 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 less. That would be ridiculous and impractical. So there's going to come a point where snow is going to keep falling, snow is going to keep going up, but I'm not going to keep putting more layers on. So what is that graph going to look like? So the layers stop going up and snow keeps falling. So I would end up with a graph that is sort of a straight line for a bit and then goes up like this. By the way, this is going to beautifully and very cleverly fit in with learning about Hooke's Law in a minute, honestly. <clears throat> Here we go. Ah, so this one was uh, a bit more physics-y, good revision. How does the force of gravity pulling on something increase as its mass increases? So if you've been to previous lessons, hopefully you're remembering that the word for how much gravity is pulling on something is its weight. And we've learned about the more massive something is, the more gravity pulls it down. In fact, there's an equation for it, isn't there? We've learned that the weight of something, you remember this? Something's weight, how much it's been pulled towards Earth, is equal to, um, we used, a, it, it was called acceleration due to gravity, or like the strength of Earth's gravitational field. Little g means how strong Earth's gravitational field is. On Earth it's about 10, let's say it's 10. Um, the weight of something is equal to the gravitational field that it's in times the thing's mass. So we can see straight away, actually, that this is a directly proportional relationship because G doesn't change, does it? Like, generally speaking, the gravitational pull of Earth, the gravitational field strength of Earth is always the same. So we can see that if mass goes up, then weight is going to go up. Like, and if, well, the gravitational field strength of Earth is 10, then if mass is 1, you would do 1 times 10, so weight would be 10. If mass was 2, so we double it, then 2 times 10 is 20. So weight has doubled as well. So, and obviously when mass is 0, weight is 0. Yeah, it sounds weird, but like, if you don't have any mass, then yeah, weight doesn't, gravity doesn't pull you down. So it goes through 0, and then as mass doubles, weight doubles, as mass doubles, so it is a straight line that goes through 0. So this is a directly proportional relationship. Um, how the amount of money you have increases as the time you work increases. Did you get this one to go through zero? If you haven't worked any hours, you haven't earned any money, right? And then again, uh, if you work one hour, you earn five pounds. What happens if we double it? If you, earn, if you work for two hours, you earn ten pounds. It has doubled. So again, this is a directly proportional relationship. Splendid. So yeah, in physics particularly, a, a law is where someone has spotted, a, often, a directly proportional relationship between two things. Uh, we've got a good famous example that we've covered already. What law have we done? F equals ma. You remember? Newton's second law. So this is uh, how much, if you push something with a certain force, then 
uh, the force you push it with is equal to its mass times how much it accelerates. Now obviously generally something's mass doesn't change, does it? So mass doesn't change. So the more force you apply to something, the more it accelerates. And again, you can see that if this doesn't change, this is a directly proportional relationship. If the force is zero, then the acceleration is zero. Yeah? So, so that's Newton's law. Robert Hooke also discovered a law. Not, not as good a law. <laughs> but I do love him. I just love all these characters from the 1600s. So I'm going to tell you the story of Robert Hooke, actually. Um, yeah, because he's just a good character. While I'm telling you the story of Robert Hooke, I should have made one to show you. Um, if you've got some scrap paper and some scissors, I'm going to do it really fast to show you what I mean. But this is just something that you can be doing to kind of... It's nice to do something with your hands while you're listening to a story, isn't it? Um, and also it means we've got something to fiddle with later, which might help your understanding. While I'm telling you the story of Robert Hooke, can you please cut a circle out of a piece of scrap paper? It doesn't really matter how big the circle is. And then make one of those spirals. You know what I mean. Just cut into... cut a spiral into the circle of paper so that you've got a kind of paper spring, yeah? Just do that, you know, you know what I mean, don't you? The sort of thing that we usually attach string to and hold it over a fire. We're not doing that today. We're just having a little fiddle uh, to help our understanding. But yeah, if you could make something like that, please, as I'm telling you the story of Hooke's Law, that would be very useful. Right, here we go. This is the very brief story of Robert Hooke, who lived between 1635 and 1703. <clears throat> here is a picture of him. Oh yeah, that's right. No pictures of Robert Hooke. Why? Well, see, Robert Hooke was an incredibly talented scientist, inventor, artist. Uh, for example, later in physics IGCSE, we'll learn about Robert Boyle, a very famous chemist who came up with Boyle's law using a very famous air pump. Here's a picture of the air pump. Um, not a lot of people know that it was actually Robert Hooke who built the air pump and demonstrated it to everyone. I'm not sure Robert Boyle even knew how to use his own air pump. Hooke was hugely involved. Um, Another example, one day Hooke delivered a lecture about how he thought the planets went round the sun because of a force. And he explained the nature of the force very well, but he didn't follow it up. So like the people who came to the lecture maybe thought it was really good, but like he didn't publish anything. Yeah, he didn't kind of formalise it. So he was, he was brilliant at loads of different things, but famously not very good at finishing things off, seeing them through. So... Hook was one of the first members of the Royal Society in London. Still there, fabulous place. Very cool team of scientists who would meet regularly um, to discuss important science issues of the day and share their ideas. So one day, someone wrote to the Royal Society, okay, with their ideas about how the planets go around the sun because of a force. And this person who'd written to the Royal Society had explained the nature of this force very well. Uh, they'd even written a whole book about it. So everyone at the Royal Society meeting says, well, this is incredible, we, this is amazing, we must give this chap money and, and publish this book so everyone can hear these great ideas. Everyone at the Royal, Science, uh, Royal Society meeting thought that this book was great, except Robert Hooke, who stood up and said that the author of the book had stolen his ideas. And this is like a big public meeting, right? So people are writing down what everyone says. <sighs> it turns out, I don't know if you've heard of it, the book was The Mighty Principia. You might have heard of it because the author is Isaac Newton. <laughs> um, oh, Hook, what have you done? So it's it said that Hook was never forgiven by Newton for the embarrassment that he caused him. Like, you know, Newton, sort of famously quite an antisocial chap anyway, and someone's just said that he's a thief in public. Um, Newton obviously became a very successful scientist. He became head of the Royal Society in the 1700s, and it's said uh, that this is the time when Hooke's portrait mysteriously went missing. Now, I have to point out that when someone says it's said, this is code for there's absolutely zero evidence for what I'm telling you, but it's a good story. But it is, you know, it's a very common story, pops up in, in a lot of uh, biographies. Some people think, <clears throat> I just learned this researching this story for you, this, this pleased me greatly. Some people think that this painting, actually, which is called Portrait of a Mathematician by Mary Beale, might be of Robert Hooke, um, but that maybe Newton tried to kind of make it anonymous to play down Hooke's achievements. And if you're thinking, Mary Beale, that sounds like a woman, but this is the 1600s. Uh, yeah, here she is. I didn't know this. Very famous painter of the time. Uh, husband lost his job, so she became, I think, the first British artist a uh, female British artist to like earn money from her work to support her whole family. So yeah, this is a painting of Mary Beale that she painted herself. 
in the 1600s. Anyway, sadly, this lesson is not Mary Beale's law, so we must move on. Um, Hook did achieve great things. One of the best things he did was he built a microscope and then used it to make lots of illustrations and published a book of what he saw, including this incredibly famous flea, which you might have seen on T-shirts. Um, obviously revolutionary at the time, because no one had looked through a microscope. Um, and he also, of course, discovered Hooke's Law. Can you? <laughs> so I could just tell you Hooke's Law, but it wouldn't be very interesting, it wouldn't be a very good brain exercise, and you, you wouldn't be likely to remember it. What I'd like you to do um, is, if you have managed to make a little paper spring, have a look at this paper spring. Hooke's law is something to do with springs and how they behave. So I'm going to show you a screen with some different things on it. I've, I've said that the Royal Society meeting begins in five minutes and you must find Hooke a law to save his reputation. Have a look at the spring. Have a look at the stuff on the screen. Think about this idea of relationships. How could you use this spring to, to work out a directly proportional relationship between two things? Here we go. I will, I will tell you. It's not impossible for you to get it. I think it's highly unlikely you'll get it, but it's fun brain exercise. Here we go. So you've got some, some masses. I wish they said kilograms on them, but they don't. I'm sorry. I couldn't be bothered to change it. But you've got some, some weight. You've got spring. You've got pencil. And you've got a ruler. What, what are you going to do? I had some absolutely brilliant ideas being thrown around in the Facebook lessons that I did live uh, yesterday. So I'm, I'll share some of those with you. I feel like I kind of know what you're going to start saying now. But I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it. Have a fiddle with your spring. I'm going to do 10 star jumps while you're thinking to try and get warmed up and then I'll go through some answers with you. Now I'm pushing it to 20, I'm very fast. Now, what you might be saying, because like I said, I've done this lesson twice with comments now, so I'm feeling a bit more confident. Some of you are just going to be looking it up. That's cheating. This is brain exercise. We're building pathways between your neurons. You're not learning anything if you just look it up. Some people were talking about like the force that the spring bounces back with. So a lot of people were getting, like maybe you pull on a spring, you add the weight to the spring and see what happens. A lot of people were saying things like, Add weights to the spring and see how much it stretches. And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, no, I can see, I see what you're getting at there, it's pretty good. I agree with you about the weights. So if you were doing the experiment, I'll show you the proper setup in a minute. But um, if you were doing the experiment and you wanted to get some results, then yes, I would maybe draw a table that had weight on one side. What's weight measured in? It's a force, so it's measured in <laughs> uh, newtons. But a lot of people are saying, like, add weights to a spring, see how much it stretches. But what, what does stretching mean? What are you going to measure stretches in? Like, what are your units? If you imagine you've got, imagine you've actually got the spring in front of you. You've got a ruler, the spring is hanging, you're adding weights to the spring. What, what are you going to measure to try and find two numbers that have a directly proportional relationship? Some people were telling me yesterday, like, centimetres. That's not bad, yeah, a distance. Let's have a look. Um, <coughs> now, obviously, if we were in a classroom, then I would give you this equipment and you would set it up. Um, so you might be thinking, oh, it's a shame, I'm just going to look at pictures of the equipment. To be honest, don't worry about it. Like, by this point in the lesson, you'd probably have 25 minutes left, and by the time the person that you were working with had finished, like, dropping everything on the floor, you'd have 50 minutes. And if you want to do physics or GCSE, you can go to a college and get your hands on this stuff, if you want to. I don't think it's going to do us any harm just to look at the pictures. But here we go. You might get an IGCSE question on how you do an experiment to uh, work out Hooke's Law. So, we've got a clamp, right? A clamp stand, a big piece of metal, really, that you can hang things off. We've got a G clamp, that's very important. You see, it looks a bit like a G. Um, so you attach the G to the clamp and the table and then you screw this thing in so that it's all tight. That's so that the clamp doesn't fall off the table because you've got a spring hanging from the clamp. You're going to add weights, masses to the spring. And if obviously if the clamp wasn't, the clamp stand wasn't clamped down with the G clamp, then the whole thing's just gonna fall off. Clamp's a funny word, isn't it? If you say it too many times. And yes, you are gonna measure something 
So I've attached a ruler to the clamp stand as well. Wear goggles. Springs be springy. They might spring off into your face, especially if they're on, right, if there's a lot of tension because you're hanging matters on. So I think that's everything. Let's have a look at what, what results you might decide to record, what might happen. So you've drawn a table, right? Well, let's say, I'm uh, sorry, it says pounds, but let's just say for ease that each one of these weights, weight masses, weighs a newton, okay? So when we add one of these weights, there's going to be a newton of force pulling down on the spring. And let's measure the length of the spring, how the length changes, right, in centimetres. So, first of all, uh, there are no masses hanging on the spring, so the force applied to the spring is zero. And the length of the spring, in this case, it just happens to be one centimetre, obviously. It could be a spring of any length, if you like. You add one newton of force, and what happens? It extends by, say, four centimetres, all right? So one newton of force, equivalent to uh, a length of four centimetres, and you keep going on. So two newtons of force, the spring becomes seven centimetres. Three newtons, it becomes ten centimetres, so on and so on and so on. Um, is this a directly proportional relationship? Hmm? I'll give you five seconds to answer that. You should, you should be able to see that, I think. Is that a directly proportional relationship? Is the graph of these results going to be a straight line that goes through zero? Five, four, three, two, one. Hopefully you're screaming at the screen, no, Lara, it's not. No, how do you know? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> because it doesn't go through zero, does it? When um, force is zero... She says, grabbing at her graph from before. Uh, length is one. Ah, oh, look! It's like the uh, level of the pond graph, yeah? So as force goes up, the length is going to get longer and longer. But the length didn't start at zero, did it? It started at one. So we've got a straight line. We've got a proportional relationship. But we haven't got a directly proportional relationship. There is quite a simple thing you can do, a simple calculation you can do to make these results into a directly proportional relationship. Let's have a look. Um, in fact, before we do that, I'll just check you know what it is, in fact. Get your, have you got an elastic band? I said to bring an elastic band with you. <coughs> Excuse me. If you get an elastic band, uh, let's just talk briefly about extension, all right? So the length of this elastic band is 15 centimeters, okay? Uh, if I pull on it gently, then the new length is 16 centimetres. How much have I extended the elastic band by? Hmm? It was 15 centimetres and I pulled on it and it became 16 centimetres. How much has the elastic band extended by? The extension of the elastic band is one centimetre, yeah? Is that okay? It's not 16 centimetres because that's just the new length, but the extension is only one centimetre. Is that okay? And extension is what you calculate if you want a directly proportional relationship here. There we go. Look at that. So when there's no force on the spring, the length is one, but it hasn't extended at all. OK, so the extension is zero. When you add one newton of force, the new length is four. But you can quite easily calculate the extension by just taking away the original length. So if the new length is four, but it was one centimetre to start with, it's extended by three centimetres. Is that OK? So first of all, it hasn't extended, and then it extends by three centimetres. When you add two newtons of force, the new length of the spring is seven centimetres, but that means it's extended by six centimetres. So is this a proportional relationship, a directly proportional relationship? Well, let's have a look. The graph goes through zero when there's zero force or zero extension. Um, let's have a look. When it's two newtons, the extension is six centimetres. What happens if we double that to four? <gasps> the extension doubles. And if we triple that, two, six, <gasps> the extension has tripled, yay! So we have a directly proportional relationship. Fabulous. Uh, right, let's take a little interval here. Oh, in fact, um, yes, yeah, so look, we can plot these into the graph just to prove it to you. Uh, we'll ignore length now. If we plot force versus extension, then you get this beautiful straight line graph which goes through zero. Congratulations, you just discovered Hooke's Law. Only 400 years, too late to be wildly famous and successful. Um, Right, let's have a little, a, a brief intermission here. Oh, well, let's tell you what. Uh, no, I'll do... Uh, um, it, uh, yeah, I'll give you this question sheet first. I've, it's, it's quite a simple one, but it just raises a lot of points that might get raised at IGCSE. Um, I've just said that two students 
have done an experiment to work out Hooke's law, but they've both made two mistakes. So I just want you to spot the mistakes and then I'll give you like the formal definition of what Hooke's law is. So yeah, it's really hard actually. Uh, they've made two mistakes each. I think two of the mistakes are really obvious. One of them is fairly easy and one of them is almost impossible to spot. So see how you get on, okay? Here's student A's equipment all set up. Here's student B's equipment all set up. Uh, can you spot their two mistakes? Like I say, I think there's two obvious ones. One fairly easy one and one is almost impossible. One that, like, when I pulled this up myself because I wrote this sheet a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I get it now and I'm quite pleased with myself, actually. I can hear you screaming at the screen. I think straight away you will have spotted that this ruler is wonky. So if you've been to my home ed lessons we've done about measuring, we will do it in these lessons at some point. Uh, if your ruler is wonky, you're not going to get an accurate measurement. If you're looking at your spring with a from side on, then uh, this isn't going to be the correct measurement. So well done if you said the ruler's wonky. The other obvious one, five, four, three... Two, one. Hopefully you also spotted uh, that this clamp stand isn't clamped to the table. So student B is going to get extremely sore feet because as soon as they start adding weight, it's all just going to fall off the table. So the ruler and the clamp stand were the obvious ones. There's one slightly less obvious one and one almost impossible one. So I'll give you a couple of seconds. Okay, so hopefully, I think plenty of you will have noticed that we need some units over here. That's the third mistake. You can't just put force and length. Like, if you came back to this experiment in a couple of weeks' time to draw a graph or something, you might not even remember whether you've measured it in millimetres or centimetres, so you must put your units in. And the one that it took me ages to spot, but I'm, I'm very pleased that I put it in because it's an important point to make, uh, it's dead confusing. This student has made a mistake because they are... They're writing extension into their table of results. Let me flip you around and I'll tell you why that's a bad idea. Um, this is really confusing, right? Because I've just told you that when you're drawing your graph um, of, to work out Hooke's law, you shouldn't use length, you should use extension. It's force and extension that is the directly proportional relationship. But you shouldn't ever do calculations in your head and then write them into a table of results, even if they're really simple calculations, because if you make a mistake, then you've got no way of spotting the mistake because all the work was in your head, yeah? Um, so if you like work out, measure the length and then you work out in your head the extension and write it in, if that's wrong, you've got to later do the whole experiment all over again. And some experiments cost, you know, like thousands of pounds to set up. So always put what's called the raw data into your table of results. So you would write down the lengths and then you could go away and come back in like a week's time or a year's time and you'd still easily be able to calculate the extension and if you made any mistakes you'd be able to spot it. Uh, so yeah I'm glad I would have forgotten to put that in if I hadn't given you that sheet. Um, yes so measure length when you're doing the experiment, calculate extension and then plot the extension on a graph. Okay so shall I actually tell you what Hooke's law is more or less? Here we go. <sighs> it's the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied. This is the first bit of Hooke's law. That's one mark at IGCSE. I'll tell you what the second mark is right now, in fact. But the extension of a spring, not the length, the extension of a spring is directly proportional to how much force you apply to the spring. Right, what's the next bit? Well, um, I, said to bring, I said to bring a piece of bread with you if you had one. If you haven't, then behold, my piece of bread. I'd like you, please. Um, we just briefly need to talk about plastic and elastic behaviour and, and compressing forces. Um, if you compress a piece of bread, which means like if you squash it, you push on it from both sides, what happens? Gently squash your piece of bread if you have one. 
What happens? <gasps> Look, it bounces back. We say, in physics, we say that the bread is behaving elastically. It is exhibiting elastic behaviour. What elastic behaviour is, is if you apply a force, then when you remove the force, the thing like returns to its um, original size and shape. So if you have an elastic band, obviously an elastic band behaves elastically, right? If you apply a force, then it changes shape. But if you remove the force, then it returns to its original shape and size, okay? Elastic behaviour. If you've still got your little paper spiral, you can apply some pulling forces to those. Uh, does the paper behave elastically? No, it does not. It just breaks. It behaves plastically, yeah? There's no stretch. It doesn't return to its original shape and size. So why is Hooke's law not an awesome law? It has to do with what I just told you. Here is it. Here it is in words. Why is it not an awesome law. It's no F equals MA, is it? The reason Hooke's law is not so awesome is, well, if you've got your paper spring, you can hold that up. Imagine it's a real spring, a metal spring. Imagine you're adding weight to the spring, okay? You add force, weight to the, to the spring, and it extends. It gets longer and longer, and that's a beautiful, directly proportional relationship until you add the last possible weight that the spring will take. And then what happens? What happens is, like that, isn't it? You end up with, it just goes, and you end up with basically a piece of wire. Um, Hooke's law is basically that uh, the force applied to a spring is directly proportional to its extension until it's not. So what that looks like is, let's draw the graph, you've got force on the y-axis for reasons which will become clear, extension on the x-axis, it's actually change in extension. A really nice way to write change in, in maths is a little triangle. So I'm going to write change in x, um, which means, yeah, the, as the, the extension changing. Okay, so as the force changes, the extension changes, it all goes through zero as we've seen, until eventually you add that last bit of force that the spring can take. So what does this look like? You add, well, force goes up a little bit, but the spring goes... So a little bit of force gives you a really big extension. So what the graph ends up looking like is this, you get this flat line at the top. This point here, where the line stops becoming straight, that's where force and extension are no longer directly proportional, yeah? Because at this point, the graph is not a straight line that goes through zero. So this point here is called the limit of proportionality. Limit of proportionality. Do you ever get these moments in physics lessons where you're like, wow, if someone walked in now, they'd be like super impressed with how physics I am. Yeah, I'm just casually writing the limit of proportionality on a graph. So, yeah, the, the, the Hooke's law. Force is directly proportional to extension <coughs> until it's not. If you want to put that properly and get two marks at GCSE or A-level, the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied until the limit of proportionality is reached. And after the limit of proportionality is reached, Hooke's law is no longer true. Hooke's, oh, Robert Hooke, God bless you, cotton socks. I just feel like it sums him up so well, you know? He just kept trying and he just kept not quite being as great as Newton. Now, that would seem to be a very good place to end the lesson. Except there's, there's just one more thing that I want to tell you because I want to put all the Hooke's Law stuff into one lesson. So I'm going to push you a little bit further and then I'm going to give you a couple of uh, past paper, like IGCSE, A-level questions. It's, it's not going to take that long. Just stick with me for a little bit, little bit longer because we've been, we've been looking at these, we've looked at a couple of laws, right? A couple of relationships. We've looked at how weight equals um, the strength of Earth's gravitational field times mass, okay? And we've looked at how F equals MA, the force that you push something with equals its mass times its acceleration. And we've looked at how G doesn't really change, right? So as mass goes up, weight goes up, usually. And we've looked at how mass doesn't usually change, so as, as F goes up, as you push more, something accelerates more, okay? And we, we said that these were directly proportional relationships. So in, in physics, it's incredibly useful to talk about laws in this mathematical way. So how are we going to talk about Hooke's law in a mathematical way? We've said that force, like 
the weight on a spring or whatever is directly proportional to the extension, yeah? That's proportional to a change in extension. Um, but what's this here? There's gotta be there's gotta be something here, right? We can't just say force equals extension, can we? If we said force equals extension, then that would be like when force is two, extension is two. When force is four, extension is four. I mean, that is true. Like that would be definitely Hooke's law. But we've done about graphs, haven't we? We know that this graph, a really really steep line, still going through zero. That's still a directly proportional relationship. But f isn't exactly equal to x. So we need we need something here. What is it? Well, uh, I'm wondering if you can work out the units for it. I'm not going to spend too long on this, but here we go. The thing, the mystery thing in Hooke's law is this k. I want you to find out what are the units of k. I'll give you a huge clue. If you can rearrange this equation and you get that k equals f divided by x. If this is getting a little bit heavy for you, then it's not going to last much longer. Hang on so that you can answer the past paper questions. Um, and I'll, I will explain this in a sec. What are the units for k? So more clues. Force is measured in newtons, yeah? And x, really, we should be measuring it in metres. We've been talking about centimetres so far, but if we would really have to convert it if we were going to do any maths. So let's say that extension is measured in metres, because length usually is in physics. And force is measured in newtons. What are the units of k? So whatever you do to the numbers, you've got to the the units. I'll just tell you. What k is, is it's called... Uh, the spring constant and its units are newtons per metre. Can you see that? So you, you're doing force divided by extension. So you're basically doing newtons divided by metres. The dividing basically just means per. If you remember the equation for speed, then you've pretty much, pretty much got this, probably. So we've learned that. Uh, we've learned that speed equals distance divided by time, haven't we? Speed equals distance divided by time, and we've looked at how the units of distance are metres and the units of time are seconds. So the units of speed are metres per second, yeah? It's just the same with the spring constant. The spring constant, which we call K, spring constant, is equal to force divided by extension, so we're basically dividing newtons by metres, so the units of the spring constant are newtons per metre. So what does the spring constant mean? It's how stiff the spring is. So if you imagine this graph again, this graph, um, the spring constant, again, if you've done the speed distance time graphs lessons we did, you might have already spotted how you work out the spring constant from looking at a a graph like this. If we've got extension going upwards on the y-axis, sorry, force going upwards on the y-axis, and extension on the x-axis here, extension, um, and this is our graph, say, how do you work out the spring constant? It's the gradient, isn't it? Did you spot that? So we've talked about how you work out the gradient of a graph. If you work out the gradient of this graph, you do this bit, which is force, divided by this bit, which is extension. So the gradient of a sort of Hooke's law force extension graph is the spring constant, and it tells you how stiff the spring is. So if you get a Hooke's law graph, a force extension graph that looks like this with a really, really steep line, then it's got a very big gradient, a high gradient, yeah? It's very steep. And what has actually happened? Well, when force is really high, the extension has only been quite small. So if the, you need to apply a lot of force to get a really little extension, then that's a very stiff spring, right? You've had to pull on it a lot to get it to move just a little bit. So a steep gradient, a high spring constant, means the spring is very stiff. And the opposite, right, is true down here. So here, with a really, really shallow gradient, we've got really high extension, but not very much force. So you don't have to pull on it very much before it extends a lot, okay? So the gradient of the graph is spring constant, which is how it says the spring is. And that does bring us to the end of the lesson. Whoa. Well done. So like I say, I'm going to give you lots of links uh, in my Facebook page to past paper questions and th things that you can use to sort of test your understanding on this because I haven't really asked you any questions in this. You won't know if you get this until you do some work in your own time. But to see if you've understood the rest of the lesson, uh, I'm going to give you four marks here at kind of A-level IGCSE. I, I mean, I think it's A-level actually, I just don't want to freak you out. <laughs>
So here we go. Question number one. What is Hooke's Law? What is it? Two marks for what is Hooke's Law anyway. Question two. A student investigates how a piece of gym equipment behaves. And they say physics is boring. They draw a graph. This, here is the graph. It's force along the top and extension going across. The graph is a curve until it gets to point A and then it turns into a straight line to all the way to point B. The student notices that the graph is a straight line between points A and B and decides the gym item obeys Hooke's law. Does it obey Hooke's law? Explain why or why not? So what is it Hooke's law for two marks? And for another two marks, you've got a force extension graph with a curvy line that becomes a straight line. Does that thing obey Hooke's law? And explain why slash why not. Um, you've got the time it takes me to pour myself a celebratory post-lesson bowl of cereal. Right, I have poured my bowl of cereal. Should we go through the answers? What is Hooke's Law? Well, here's the mark scheme. Um, it's a mark scheme, right? So it's just cutting to the chase. Force is proportional to extension. Um, you have probably written it more nicely than that, but the, the force on a spring is directly proportional or proportional to its extension, uh, or to how much it extends. That is one mark, well done. And if you mentioned the limit of proportionality, fantastically well remembered, um, that's one mark as well. The, <clears throat> I've left this in. Uh, yeah, I'd better talk about the elastic limit for people who really want to know everything at the end. You don't need to know about the elastic limit. Um, but your correct answer is until the limit of proportionality is reached. Elastic limit comes up more at A level, but I will talk about it in a sec for people who really want to know. Um, this, this graph does not obey Hooke's law. So well done. You just got one mark at A-level straight away if you said, no, it doesn't obey Hooke's law. And the reason is uh, the line doesn't go through zero or the graph is a curve before A or the graph isn't a straight line at first. Obviously, they're all pretty much saying the same thing. I thought that was quite easy. And then in the first Facebook lesson I did, someone made a really good comment and I realised that I don't think I'd actually been getting a mark for it because... I'd been saying the graph doesn't go through zero. And someone pointed out that, of course, the graph does go through zero. It's the line that doesn't go through zero. So I, would, I think I'd have said the graph go, doesn't go through zero. And I wouldn't have got a mark. Be very careful. It's that the straight line portion of the graph doesn't go through zero. OK, or it's a curve before A. Any of that is fine. <clears throat> right. Um, so, yes. That is the end of the lesson. Thank you very much for everyone for uh, supporting me. Thank you very much for coming. It's nice to know that people are here. In a second, I will go to my Facebook page and see if anyone has left me any comments. So there's always a Facebook post up for people who are watching uh, to be able to ask me questions or say hello. Um, just refresh the page. If you are enjoying these lessons, if you are using me as a resource and you want to support me, you totally can. You can go to my about section on YouTube, children, not you, but get an adult to do it. Um, gently nag. Uh, I will send you Theatre of Science magazine. All I need to do this as a job is five or six pounds a month from like most people who watch. So it's totally working. Amazing business model. Five or six pounds a month. Uh, there's enough people who've signed up that it is my job. I can do this lesson and couple of other lessons in the week, everything for free and the uh, worksheets for free as well. And I'll even send you Theatre Science magazine, which I'm wildly proud of. This one's on time. It's kind of suitable for all ages. I've, I've always learned something. I don't think many adults would know much of what is in Theatre Science magazine. Uh, it's on time, so it's got a free, well, I, I mean, it's, it's a magazine, so obviously everything in it is kind of free once you've got it. It's a craft uh, to make a sundial. There's a beautiful comic about a woman who sold time. Um, I've explained Einstein's theory of relativity as best that I can. There's a, a thing about slow worms, kind of a pun, because slow. 
this time, but slow worms are cool. Right, uh, I'm going to tell you very quickly about the elastic limit before I read these uh, before I read these comments out. Right, the graph of Fuchs law. I've just said that it's a straight line because force and extension are directly proportional until they're not, because here you get the limit of proportionality, which is where they stop being proportional. The limit of pro 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 I'm just going to leave it there. There is another thing called the elastic limit, and it's when the spring stops behaving elastically. So remember I said this bread is behaving elastically because it's kind of springing back into its original shape. Um, the point where the spring stops behaving elastically is not quite the same place as the limit of proportionality, which is a bit weird, and you go into it at A level. It's, it's, weirdly, it's a little bit further down. Um, this is called the elastic limit. It's worth knowing because obviously they change the specifications and if you end up doing this IGCSE in a couple of years time you might have to learn about the elastic limit. You probably see it mentioned if you if you revise. They've said in your specification this year, like for the upcoming exams, that you don't need to know about the elastic limit. They're so similar that usually if you write elastic limit you would get a mark even if you meant limit of proportionality. But can we please remember uh, the limit of proportionality. Don't forget about the elastic limit until I start doing uh, A-level physics lessons. In uh, Who knows? Let's get through this first. <laughs> right, has anyone left me in the comments? I'm so punged up. <laughs> so gross. Oh, one comment! Is this uh, gonna be... Oh, <laughs> no! One comment from someone saying that they can't find me. That's, that's bad, isn't it? Uh, well, I hope you found me. It's wildly too late now, isn't it? I'm gonna go and eat my cereal before our lesson on pathogens begins over on Facebook. If you come to the All Ages Homework lesson, we're doing all about pathogens. Very exciting. I knew nothing about pathogens, uh, but now I do. So yeah, come and give me some comments on that at 11 o'clock on my Facebook page if you like. Until then, uh, I'll see you next week. Well, I think we might have to do some maths. I may try and pre-record next week's lesson because we've really got to cover all the maths you need for IGCC. But I'll think about that later. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Bye.